Welcome to Chapter 19, States and Societies of Sub-Saharan Africa. So the first time we talked about Africa, it was really about the Bantu migrations and the out of Africa theory. Well, this will sort of continue that and expand on that a bit. So as I said before, the earliest African migrations came from the Bantu group, and they had their migrations for a pretty long time. And through this, they did some things such as spreading agriculture and their herding practices such as pastoralism. And through this, they displaced or absorbed many hunting, gathering, and other fishing groups in Africa. Around 500 BCE, they also included iron metallurgy and facilitated clearing more land for growth. So with iron metallurgy and their agricultural techniques, they really got some important crops, and those are yams, sorghum, and millet. And these three are really important crops that you should associate with Africa. And then later on, they also got bananas from Asia. So the African political organization, it was really a kin-based society. And what this really means is it was a stateless society. So there weren't really kingdoms or empires, although there were some. But for the most part, people governed through family and kinship groups. For example, there was a village council, and that was really just the group of the male family heads in the village. And then there was a chief of the village, which was like the most prominent family head. A group of villages often constituted a district, and that's basically how villages grew. There were also chiefdoms, so over time, population growth strained resources and increased conflict between neighboring tribes. And so some African communities bound together and organized military forces. And then within these military forces, the powerful chiefs overrule overrode the kinship networks and imposed authority through these new chiefdoms. So these were just like bigger villages. So then we have the significance of the Islamic kingdoms and empires. So as we talked about in the last video, or actually it was a couple of videos back, the Islamic kingdom really started to grow. And through this, one example of it was the use of camels. So camels were really widely used in the Middle East and they were diffused over to Africa. So the camel's arrival was really good because it quickened the pace of communication across the Sahara and it also helped Islamic merchants who crossed the desert to establish relations. And so one of the first kingdoms that uh, relations were established was were es relations were established with was Ghana. And Ghana was this kingdom that was this big commercial site in West Africa, and it mainly provided gold, which was its most important commodity, ivory, and slaves for traders from North Africa. And these Ghana kings, many of them converted to Islam, but they didn't force it on their inhabitants. But ultimately, this kingdom of Ghana suffered from nomadic raids, and it weakened the kingdom in the early 13th century. Then there was the second big civilization, named the Mali Empire, and it had this big capital city at Timbuktu. The second important kingdom that many Islam traders encountered was the Mali Empire, and it was founded by Sundiata, or the Lion Prince. And through this building in the Mali Empire, the Mali Empire grew through trading. It basically controlled and taxed almost all trade passing through West Africa. So most of these kingdoms at the time were located in West Africa. And through this, they really linked these enormous caravans to North Africa, which was more controlled by the Islamic merchants. So there was this important empire of Mali, and in this, there was also Sundiata's grandnephew, who was Mansa Musa. So Mansa Musa was this really famous ruler. He basically made this lavish pilgrimage to Mecca in the 1300s, and he brought this huge caravan, so it was like loaded with gold, and throughout every stop along the way to Mecca, he was just dishing out vast amounts of gold. In fact, he dished out so much gold that the price of gold decreased severely in every place where he traveled. So upon return to Mali, he was recommitted to the cause of Islam and built mosques and sent students to study with distinguished Islamic scholars in Northern Africa. And he also built new infrastructure such as Islamic schools to further spread the growth of Islam. But ultimately, Mali declined as well due to factions and military pressures from neighbors and nomads. 
and that gave way to the Songhai Empire, which replaced Mali by the late 15th century. On the other half of the continent was the Indian Ocean trade and the Islamic states of East Africa, and these are commonly called the Swahili states, which is an Arabic term meaning coasters. So these states really dominated the East African coast, and they spoke Swahili, which was like a syncretic Bantu language that had some Arabic words mixed into it. And these people they traded with the Muslim merchants pretty heavily, and it was really important by the 10th century. And in these states, of course, there were chiefs like the rest of Africa, but there were also many ports that were developed, and these became city states governed by kings. And in the 11th and 12th centuries, it really started to be the main center of trading. One good example was Kilwa, and they exported gold. And a final big, sort of like city-ish on the Swahili coast was Zimbabwe. So it was this powerful kingdom of East Africa, and Eventually, the rulers decided to build this magnificent stone complex known as Great Zimbabwe, and this Great Zimbabwe was really sort of like this first. Well, it wasn't the first great city in Africa, but it was one of the fewer great cities in Africa. Even though a lot of people don't even know if it exists today, and these kings organized the flow of gold, ivory, and slaves, so that was a big deal as well. So Islam was obviously a big deal in East Africa, and the ruling elite and wealthy merchants most frequently converted. And this conversion prompted a close cooperation with the Muslim merchants who traded heavily in the area. And this conversion also opened the door to political alliances with new Muslim rulers. And an important person to know is Ibn Battuta. He was basically this Moroccan scholar and traveler. He was born in Morocco, and he first made his pilgrimage. And once he made his pilgrimage, he really just never left home. He just traveled all around the world, as far as China and Malacca, and Southeast Asia, and he really just tried to see how Islam was practiced in the rest of the world and see how other kingdoms treated it. But he was this really learned man. So many times in different regions like India and the Maldives Islands, he was appointed the judge or the cadi. Of that area for a small time. Basically, we he was like the Marco Polo, but not of Italy, but of the Arab world, and he really gave us insight into what other places around this time were like. So, African society and cultural development. As said before, they lived in all sorts of hierarchies, such as villages, kingdoms, empire, city states. Although villages were the most common, and these. They really practiced these communal practices, so it was communities claimed the rights to land, no private property, unlike what the Europeans really felt about. Also, there were sex and gender relations. So even though Africa was patriarchal and that men dominated, the women were still really important. For example, they took a lot of heavy roles and had influences as merchants and markets. And for these women, it was also good because Africa was. This matrilineal society—that means a person's roots is traced through the mom, unlike a patriarchal, patrilineal society of the rest of the world. So that was a plus for women there. Also, there was the issue of slavery. So most slaves were captives of wars, debtors, criminals, and they worked as agricultural laborists, or they were sold in slave markets. So the thing we most Don't seem to understand is that slavery occurred many hundreds of years before Europeans started plundering them. In the fifteen, sixteen hundreds, they actually had their own slaves as prisoners of wars and things like that. So slavery was a big deal even before the Europeans came. African religions and cultures. So generally, they believed in lesser gods and spirits. So animism. And they associated these with the natural features of the world. They also believed in ancestor souls, so like ancestor veneration, much like China. And they had many different types of rituals to sort of practice about. Throughout all this, African religion was not theological, but rather practical. But it wasn't always great, and it gave way to Christianity and Islam. Ultimately, these outsiders were successful in bringing in other religions, such as Christianity and Islam. So with these. There were developments in North Africa with early Christianity. So Christianity reached North Africa in the first century after Christ, and it was in the Christian kingdom of Aksum in Ethiopia. So Ethiopia was sort of the central hub for Christianity.
before Europeans actually came in themselves. This was the 4th century. And these Ethiopian Christians, they did some pretty amazing stuff, one of which was carving churches out of solid rock. So it was like an actual underground church. And they also translated the Bible there. And this was really giving way to something called Coptic Christianity. So Coptic, you will associate with Egypt or Ethiopia. That area is Christianity. It's not as big today because of Islam coming in, but it was it's still a pretty big deal though. Also, African Islam. So this was basically the greatest religion in Africa. It appealed strongly to the ruling elite, as I said before, and the merchants of sub-Saharan Africa. And these people, they took it seriously. So they built mosques, schools, and they really expanded. And they really syncretized a bit to the African gender relations of putting women ahead a bit to give them more freedoms. And for many, it supplemented rather than replaced the traditional religions. So it's really just a syncretism for these Africans. So this has been chapter 19, States and Societies of Sub-Saharan Africa in Traditions and Counters, 4th edition. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you in the next one.